The Jetsons 1963 Issue 2 The tax box establishes the Jetsons as apartment dwellers, not that their so-called apartment building looks like one. So they share a garage with the Jones family, and ironically, despite being called the Jones, they're the ones jealous of the Jetsons for the frivolous stuff they bought. Elroy shows that his ray gun's only a toy because all it can kill is flies. He tells Astro he forgot his bone, and Astro uses the auto bone bringer on his tail to get it. And the Jones' son gets mad. It's interesting to see the main characters of his sitcom family be the rich neighbors instead of their neighbors. Judy gets home from a space scooter ride with her current new boyfriend, and eventually the Jetsons family get intimidated by the sound of an outdated space mobile, which was revved up by the father to make a loud noise to act big. The Jones family look forward to getting more money, with the wife thinking she'll be the most up-to-date woman in the universe. Later on, George finds out the Jones got a new car to brag to him about. Six months earlier than anyone else could get one. He brags about the fact that it's a self-driving car, and George sees it as a sneak peek into the future. Ironic, because self-driving car technology came first, of course. It should have been how George's car was. Then Mrs. Jones brags to Jane about her hovering hat, and Elroy gets chased by the kid from earlier holding a static electricity shooter, which wouldn't be produced because its only function would be to annoy people. Though I guess you could say the same thing about the slingshot, I don't know why that was sold for kids either. Somehow, Judy breaks the window just by leaning on it, and then it stops looking broken in the next panel. She somehow isn't injured for months after that, and instead bores me with her jealousy of her neighbor for less interesting reasons. Even Astro howls because the neighbor's dog has a robot buried bones in the cement and fill up the hole because apparently it's against the law to leave a dirt patch about. Astro only has a bone homing device. You'd think Astro wouldn't be jealous because it's a dog's instinct to bury the bones, so the dog would feel like he's missing out on something if he's not the one burying it. This is Astro thinking like a human. George plans to buy things to keep up with the Joneses. Jane justifies that he can afford it as an automatic mechanic. I thought he'd press the buttons to make things for Mr. Spacely. He doesn't repair cars. I don't think it's automatic to just press a button. How did Judy find out Jill's boyfriend had an older brother when they didn't know Facebook would be invented yet? George shouldn't be so surprised that he isn't allowed to get a car early when his rival only got it early to test it for a company. I assume because he knows the right person. Jane finds out that her neighbor is only testing that fireworks hat, so she can't get another like it or better. Couldn't Jane tell Elroy to invent something like it or better? I guess because Elroy's a kid, there's only a very small variety of things he can invent. Elroy complains that his bratty rival's toy gun is only a test model. Also, why doesn't Elroy say he's gonna invent something just like his bratty rival's toy gun? I wonder if all these things being just test models will backfire on the neighbors. But then the main characters won't get to do anything at all against them to ruin their days. Elroy says he can't get an automatic bone barrier for Astro because that's a new technology that's not out yet, but not all the other things this spoiled family has even though all it consists of is a machine to make a hole and fill it, which we already know how to do. Again, why doesn't the comic have Elroy say, I'll just have to figure out how to make one? Judy complains that the older brother she found out about already has a wife, but the family sees their neighbors being made miserable by the test models they were given for tons of different creative reasons. I guess I don't feel like saying why, because it doesn't really matter why. It all makes sense. Why does the recording on the car say, this is a recording? Somehow, he was dumb enough to press the hot dog button by accident and hurt his girlfriend, who somehow was appreciating machine instead of him kissing her hand. George laughs at his neighbor for crashing his space mobile, so he gets karma because his own space mobile's anti-gravity cons out, and his neighbor says he's got a flat, an outdated phrase for a car without wheels. George complains that Jane's hat is out of whack from the jolt. I already got the message of the story without Jane hammering it in. 
According to the story, it's not that material things aren't so great. It's that you shouldn't trust test models. Miraculously, George's neighbor looks as ashamed as him and shakes his hand and says the better message that he shouldn't have envied George's property when he worked hard to earn it. Even Jimmy is nice to Elroy completely unprompted. If he's never like that, that's out of character. This is interesting because it comes out of nowhere. I thought the Jones were just evil. But I'll take a story being unexpectedly light-hearted over how some series are now, where they're relentlessly depressing and don't know when to stop. This seems sappy, but we didn't know the Jones very well. So for all we know, it could make perfect sense that they have a heart. George offers to take the Jones on a picnic. Jane makes the wise decision that they should just walk to their picnic spot. And the story ends with Jimmy and Elroy racing floating picnic baskets that they didn't seem to have last issue. In the next story, some kids bragged about the breed of dog they have. And Elroy's actually ashamed and says Astro's just a plain old dog, even though Astro's the only talking dog I've seen in the series. If this comic never had some talk like Scooby-Doo, then this will be justified. But right now, it looks like it's writing with no self-awareness. Sure, in the comic, he hasn't talked yet, and he's not exactly a looker, but he acts pretty human, acting proud when the other boys brag about their dogs, which means that he knows what they're saying. The other boys must be rich snobs, because they laugh at Elroy just for having a plain old dog, like most people would. It's ironic that Elroy lives in a rich neighborhood, because aren't we supposed to believe that George doesn't have the kind of job that would give you a lot of money compared to other people? Like, all he does is push buttons all day, like a ton of other people. He's not in upper management. The boy with an adult-like face brags that his dog graduated from dog trick school because he's so desperate to one-up Elroy for some unexplained reason. Maybe because Elroy's an inventor, it makes other boys jealous and get an inferiority complex. Because this is a pattern now. When normally Elroy's a nice kid, so otherwise I wouldn't see a reason for them to not like him. After the scene that went on a bit too long, Elroy takes a can, and Astro sniffs the floor and jumps over a stone wall, causing him to land on a neighbor, and Elroy tells him to get off him. Thankfully, it's explained why he did this. He still hates him for stepping on his tail years ago, but the problem is, it was an accident. So Astro looks uncharacteristically petty. Or maybe his character was just so forgettable in the show that I forgot about him being petty. It's explained that this guy's dog doesn't act emotional because he's a graduate of dog detemporizing school. He convinces Elroy to do the same with Astro. Kids sure would have a lot of independence if they were allowed to do this with their dogs alone. It's not like Elroy wears a card on his shirt with a government insignia on it that says Genius Inventor, giving him special privileges. And yet Elroy plans to raid his bank account to pay for dog training, rather than keeping it simple and having him ask his dad, like anyone would expect. Or at least selling an invention of his. Elroy just so happens to go to the bank when it's just been robbed by someone who's either a fly guy alien, or is wearing a mask that looks a lot more like a cartoon bomb than a fly, and just buzzes to have a memorable theme as a robber because he has an ego. He steps on Astro's tail, getting him to have a grudge against him, and he flies away with space wings. Elroy's told by the bank, go figure after it just got robbed, that they're out of money today. The cops show up with space wings of their own to be more competent, and one says they have absolutely no clues because the robber wore a mask and plastic gloves. All of them would then. If that was literally all it took for a criminal to never be tracked down, there'd be way more crime than usual. Almost no one would be getting arrested. But this is the future we're talking about. They'd be even better at tracking down criminals. I assume that Elroy's dog is going to help them because he has a great sense of smell and is right there. Shockingly, instead of Elroy making that suggestion, he just says he saw the criminal fly towards the Lunar Towers Hotel. The cops lose faith because the hotel has a thousand rooms and by the time they searched a few, the robber would have left. I can't help but have a gut feeling that this wouldn't make it impossible for a criminal to get caught somehow. Elroy decides to stroll past the Lunar Towers just to have something to do. I assume Elroy's not on the moon, 
So the only reason they would be called Lunar Towers is if that's a brand name that started from the hotel chain's first hotel being on the moon. I can't wait for them to make permanent residential areas on the moon. Astro sniffs the floor, and already looks like an idiot by not immediately knowing that he's gonna track down the thief, and instead telling him to not get emotional and embarrass him again. At least he figures things out in the next panel. Elroy runs up the stairs. It's weird that there would ever be stairs in a future that's built to the brim with frivolous, expensive-looking technology like slide walks. But apparently they still have to have cost-cutting measures in some places. Still, even modern-day apartment buildings can afford elevators. So what is this hotel's excuse? It's a hotel chain so successful that it branched out from starting on the moon. But one of its hotels is too cheap to afford two elevators. I'd say two, because having just one elevator would justify stairs just in case the elevator broke down. Elroy sees the thief tying up Astro's feet with convenient rope. The story skipped to this point to have this look logical. In his debut episode, he had no problem terrorizing a burglar, so he'd think he'd have already bit him before he could do this. Elroy calls out for the police, making the thief decide to scram out the window. He puts on his helmet, but wonders who blacked out the eye holes. It turns out Elroy for once did use his brain when it was mandatory to solve the plot. So the robber flies into the wall, and Elroy leads the cop to him instantly, because I guess the cop was conveniently right next to him. The cop somehow expects me to believe that the art of bloodhounding went out style. That would only happen if they invented an artificial bloodhound. It makes me sad to think that because the comic's thankfully episodic, it's probably going to drop this next story. That's a shame, because I'd love for Astro to be a police dog, because they make him constantly useful. Why can't there be a show with a police dog as one of the main characters, with his own subplot around it every time? I guess because it'd get repetitive, because he'd always deal with the same few things. But then you can only show him deal with those things once. In the next story, Jane asks George as he's relaxing at home to help with the house cleaning. Why does she need some help with it when it's automatic hands doing all of the window washing when well, that's all she says she's busy with? It's just an excuse to get him the help to get it done faster because she's lazy. George's chair has a robot hand holding the newspaper for him and another one holding a drink in front of his chin and they both know to get out of the way for him when he tries to sit up. Then one of the hands presses a vacuum button on the wall and somehow George says he didn't know the Easy Chair could do that. And yet he's not questioning it, after all of his experience with the Easy Chair. This would only make sense if Elroy modified it to do this, and he assumed that. A robot vacuum shaped like a normal vacuum goes out of the way like a Roomba. And what's confusing is the robot hand pushing George back down on the chair. How's he happy? Why would it be so forceful? Jane plans to ask George to call the vending machine robots to deliver more food, and she's standing in front of buttons with the words leftovers in front of her. She wonders how George got away from his easy chair, and notices that he unplugged it. She hears his space car flying away, and sees that he's got a golf club. I mean, go-off club. Why would the future change its name? Maybe this universe never called it golf. Someone complains that her own husband is barely around because he started playing go off. And Jane stays optimistic and wisely tells her to focus on the times where he's home. She says he hasn't been at home for a week. That really is concerning. It comes off like he was kidnapped if she's not explaining that he has a tournament. She decides to go out to the go off course in the broad band of asteroids path past the moon. I want to start calling it Gulf, because that name is so stupid. It's actually kind of hard to say. Well, it's not exactly like Golf, but still, that's Golf in space. They call football Space Football, why not this Space Golf? Someone who looks too much like George says George should be ready to golf from hole 5 about now. And Jane thanks him without thinking about how similar he looks to her husband. The golf club has fire behind it, and someone says to fill his club with more blast gas. If they are literally not putting any effort into swinging with the golf clubs, it's not a sport. How are they even precisely aiming it? I guess they still have some degree of control over it somehow, with their minds? Jane realizes that because of space coop, 
uses blast gas for fuel too, she could run out of gas near George, forcing him to fill up her tank and ride home with her. She'd sabotaging his happiness without even waiting for him to be away too long first. This is like the awful excuse for a wife, Wilma, from the Flintstones. Both her and her friend dedicate themselves to ruining their husbands' fun the second they try to go out and have fun. Like bullying. Especially if it conflicts with their fun. Couldn't even get past 10 episodes because of that. She wants to scare him into swearing off golf. She'd be more sympathetic if she waited a week first. I'm on her side, but barely. For all we know, this is a sitcom misunderstanding where she's assuming too quickly that George is like this other woman's husband. Because this is a more light-hearted, sappy sitcom, not a comedic sociopathy one there's way too much of now. So it'd be likely that she's wrong. Jane has her plan be even more clever because she decides to let George's ball hit her coop to play up the sympathy. Even though that isn't necessary. But hey, at least I'm seeing a main character use her brain correctly again. George sees Jane floating near the out-of-bounds flag, with the two of them wearing nothing but head bubbles as an explanation for why they can breathe in space. No oxygen tank on their backs or astronaut suits to keep the rest of their body warm. It'd actually be better to not establish that they're in a no-air environment then, by having these bubbles that could barely hold any air. But apparently they're constantly manufacturing more air, so it doesn't matter how small they are. And their clothes probably have electric lining so they can be as warm as they want. Jane says she came to the golf course out of boredom, and he holds her hand. He says he has to catch his ball, or he'll score out of the low millions. The score of a go-off game is the number of miles the ball travels total. And they see a guy asking for water because he's been drifting here a week, because he missed his ball. He'd still be provided with water, otherwise that'd be illegal. They'd have some supervision, and he must be going on a break to go to the toilet. What is stopping him from leaving to take a break and get water? If there's nothing, that's a dumb explanation for someone being here weak. This place would have an unbreakable dome around it to keep the scenario from happening, and I'd like said dome to be an air dome. George says he has to do something for exercise. And Jane says she'll find another active but safe sport for him. She uses rope to make it so that George can choose to not take it easy on the easy chair. But the amount of exercise he'd get by not using the easy chair like an easy chair would be absolutely minimal, even if it would add up. So they're lucky she even thought of this. She says that guy's wife and her came up with an old game for him that involves hitting a ball to the other player with vacuums. And Jane proves she actually is supposed to be seen as lazy, with her refusal to name the game. At this point, I feel like these issues have way too many pages, because I've typed enough as it is, without having to deal with the Judy story. Judy gets seen on the visual phone by a guy she doesn't like, who has an adult face again. Why did Ace even bother trying to ask her out and keep up the relationship, when the fact that she doesn't want him to see her on the call makes it obvious that she's no longer into him? He's just so desperate that he'll get her interest back. He wants her to go with him to a dancing contest. Why does she agree if she clearly doesn't want to? She literally has a different boyfriend every time, so I don't see why she wanted to dump him immediately after getting tired of him when it's obvious there would always be more guys willing to date her in a heartbeat and she doesn't like him. I don't get the sense that she'd stick with anyone until they dump her with all of her boyfriends, unless she's that unlucky that they all dump her. But I haven't been told that, and her boy craziness is the only thing I'm ever hating about her, so why would they all dump her? Maybe that's why, she's too quick to get them jealous, because she can't hide that she's interested in other guys. I should have seen at least once that that's always what she's dumped. At least she has the self-awareness to say that she hates to sound self-centered, before explaining that she's tired of Ace for never bringing her flowers to wear to dances. She's embarrassed, because all the other girls get flowers, well apparently he's too cheap. Her dad sees a simple solution, which somehow isn't to dump him and ask out someone else. Instead he gives her money to buy herself a corsage. He says Ace will take notice and get the hint. She compliments him, and says at the shop that everyone has corsages of earthly flowers. She sees flowers that were grown on Venus, Pluto, and Saturn. 
Venus is way too hot for that with a thick atmosphere. And Saturn's a gas planet. Either terraforming technology took a huge leap to the point of being witchcraft to make them places where Earth greenhouses exist, or Venusian and Saturn is being very generous, when really these flower greenhouses were grown on satellites in the orbit of those planets. Because while maybe Venus could have Earth greenhouses eventually, it's off limits for a gas planet. We can grow Earth plants on Mars with our technology, so I can buy this for Pluto, a similarly cold place. My point is, there's no way planets as inhospitable as these would have native flowers, so there's zero point in calling them Venusian or Plutonian when they could only be grown outside of those planets' natural environments. There's nothing forcing them to be grown on a satellite outside of that planet's orbit in particular. It's just a name brand thing. Also, while we all know Pluto's not a planet, I let it slide because it doesn't have to be exactly like our universe but in the future. This universe just has Pluto be the size of a planet. Maybe it was artificially made bigger. Of course the flowers are too expensive. Judy says she only has five dollars. The discussion I was inspired to have about foreign planet flowers interested me enough to forgive this being a boring Judy plot. You could have replaced foreign planet with foreign country just fine so far. But then I want to have gotten a brainstorm about how this could be possible, and look forward to the future. Judy gets told to look in a box for $5 flowers, and she decides to take one because it's so different from the rest. I immediately assume that's going to be the cause of the conflict of the plot because she said this. If she didn't, I wouldn't have ever known it was different. She hands the shopkeeper the money, he thanks her, and somehow does nothing to warn her about the flower. She brags about a rare marchant flower. Again, there'd never be flowers native to Mars. Unless you want to stretch the definition of native to include genetically engineered thing that could only survive on places like Mars. And without being altered, it was originally a thing native to Earth or something. Because if they changed Mars to have Earth's atmosphere like they must have done in Futurama, then you might as well say its plants are Earth flowers because they could grow on there too. Her parents are happy for her, with her mom saying it'll look beautiful in her hair. She asks Ace if he notices anything new, and he only says there's a new space burger station in orbit. I guess he just took it for granted that she buy a corsage for herself. She's such a doormat, because she doesn't simply say her problem, for no reason. So she does actually have a personality trait, other than being nice or boy crazy. She somehow convinces herself that he'll notice the flower later. And then skips to demanding him to let her out of here when they're 100 feet above the ground in his scooter. She didn't say that though, as she says. He believes her right away instead of wondering why that voice must sound exactly like hers for him to mistake it for hers. Either it's a very little known feature of this flower, or it doesn't sound just like her because one of them would have commented on it. The flower says it's being kidnapped, and somehow Judy just now says that sounds like it came from very close. By sheer coincidence, a police space mobile was right there, and the cop goes after Judy because there's a Martian in her hair. So, he hates all Martians, period? How could they all be this arbitrarily annoying? This thing is clearly sentient, so it would be stupid to assume it's an illegal immigrant on sight. Judy's too stubborn to give up her flower when it's clearly potentially dangerous. So she runs inside, and finds out that they got the gravity turned off. Judy looks out and gets declared the winner of something anti-gravity related. Out of nowhere, it turns out Martians are harmless. Then why did the cop care? He takes it off her head, and he complains that he should have stayed away from the flower fields when those posy picking machines were at work. How does anyone still have a job if they can assign basic manual labor to machines so easily. They must be forced by the government that some things just can't have machines do it. But where do they draw the line? Can't be that some jobs lobby for it because you'd think all the jobs would lobby for it. Judy naturally asks him why he didn't say something when she first chose him at the flower store. He says that he couldn't because she held him by the throat and it took a while for him to get his voice back. How dark. She apologizes, but compliments his appearance, and he thanks her, conveniently liking her right away. The cop plans to put him aboard the next bus to Mars. 
He must insist on this because he just assumes on sight that Martians don't have green cards to permit them to be on Earth. Is Mars just so much better than Earth that literally no Martians want to go visit Earth? Ace at least admits that she's right that this was all his fault. He says he'll plant a quick grow plant seed straight out of witchcraft in her trophy. He ends the story by showing her flowers growing out of the trophy and telling her to pick her own from now on. Right off the spotted plant. She's still sad because he doesn't want to present her with flowers himself. Why doesn't she just tell him to keep them in his house so he could do that? At this point, the only reason he wants to do that is that he's too lazy to keep the flowers alive himself. Then there's a page where George goes to an electrono cook machine to choose the beef stew button. They must all be already made and constantly kept warm like it's a fast food place, as he gets it instantly. He calls it terrible, and somehow the robot hand has the free will to dump the plate of food on its master's head. This would only make sense if Elroy had another moment of wanting revenge on him, so he reprogrammed it to do that. This was a generic story about the Jetsons keeping up with the Joneses. I assume it's generic, it's based on a phrase. But I never actually saw this plot before. I think I've only seen one family sitcom that's live action. It just comes off like something that must have happened tons of times because it'd be so easy to come up with for a slice of life franchise. So it saves this plot from being a boring cliche to futuristic technology keeping it interesting the whole time. This series is all about spectacle constantly wowing the audience with its technology. And most of the characters are nice, harmless people. Not complete idiots, keeping me from hating it because they remain a part of its charm. Elroy's story was about Elroy getting teased by presumably jealous kids that he has a plain old dog, somehow ignoring the fact that only he can talk. And while it seems to be leading to Elroy putting Astro through dog training and then deciding that he missed the old Astro for some reason, the story never gets to that point. Which is a relief, because that would have been too predictable and cliche, compared to the bank just so happening to get robbed, which is also cliche, before Elroy could withdraw from his kid's bank account for dog training. The bank robber stepping on his tail caused him to be motivated to track down his scent for Elroy, and Elroy has a brilliant plan to black out the holes in the guy's helmet to make him crash into the wall when he flies with it. And then shout for the police, making him be in too much of a hurry to check the helmet first. Clearly Astro didn't need to have his tail stepped on for him to feel motivated to get an evil person arrested. So it'd be dumb to expect me to believe that. But I still respect that it was a check of his gun. Because a neighbor did that some earlier. And Astro proved to him that he was good as he was anyways without even needing to have a boring montage where he went through dog training. If it weren't for the bad guy getting stopped because he had space wings and flew into the wall from them, I'd accuse this of being a plot that could happen in any sitcom. But either way, it's creative and interesting to me. I still worry that there's only a few plots you could really tell with Astro though, so I hope he's not used too much for the basis of a plot. It's a good thing he's paired up with Elroy, though I wonder why they're not giving Elroy his own stories. Jane's story as Jane get worried by her neighbor into thinking her husband would be away for a week because he plays golf. So she goes off to do a clever plan to trick him into going home with her. She'd be more sympathetic if she waited before doing this for even a day first. But she's portrayed as right because somehow the space golf course has no measure in place to keep a missed ball within a certain reasonable distance from where it was hit away. Like a dome or gravity control, causing people to take a week chasing it. I thought Antagonist was holding people prisoner there out of greed, but that wasn't explained. This guy was just too stubborn to go home and get some water and stayed here a week because he was doing poorly at a golf game. Maybe he just hates his wife. But that isn't explained either. Either way, Jane saves them both and gives him a better game to play somewhere safe. But you'd think since it's in her home, it'd risk breaking her things from the ball hitting them. Normally this might be a very typical family sitcom story about the wife feeling like a golf widow. Not that I know it's overdone in family sitcoms. I think I only watched Alf. I'm just saying this based on what seems to be a very easy plot to come up with. But it's made interesting because of the sci-fi aspect of the golf game. But still, nothing is forcing this man to not go home in a week. So the sci-fi thing is just there for spectacle. Because there's still the same explanation you could come up with. That you'd have the plot 
if it was mundane, that he wants a lot of time away from her in general. But George just wanted exercise. In the final story, Judy's upset that her current boyfriend never buys her flowers for the dance. Rather than it occurring to anyone that she should dump him, because clearly she can instantly get a new one. As we never get shown how hard it is for her to get a new one, so it seems easy, George gives her money for a new corsage. Then she wants to be special, so she decides to buy a flower from Mars. It's an interesting twist, that instead of the flower actually being evil, it's a sentient being that the posy picking machines mistook for a flower. And he can't tell her that in the box because she grabbed him by the throat. He must have been unconscious until she opened the box then. Because you'd think he would have escaped on his own if he didn't want this. It seems too complicated, but that's not a problem. I just admire how creative it was. It would have been too predictable to make it turn out to be a Venus flytrap style plant. For once we have a story that requires it to be in the future. Because this flower being an alien causes the resolution of the plot. Before that, it was an easy plot to come up with based on the first sentence of its premise. It only got interesting because I had to wonder how there could be Venusian and Saturn flowers. Her boyfriend doesn't learn at the end, though. And she doesn't break up with him on screen. So I'm left wondering why, because while I assume she only dates guys for their looks, there has to be a lot of good-looking guys that take her out that look better than him. So why is she settling for this ugly guy? Is insecurity why she assumes she won't ever get another boyfriend every time she gets one? And so she doesn't want to risk it?